This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 41 of Through the Fairy Tale Halls of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Good Comrades of the Flying Ship. There lived once upon a time in Russia a peasant and his wife. And they had three sons. Two were clever, and the third was thought a fool. The elder brothers were forever telling him he had no wits, and he found himself always treated as if he was no use whatsoever. One day they had all heard of a writing that had come from the Tsar, which said, Whoever builds a ship that can fly, to him I will give my daughter, the Tsarevna, to wife. The elder brothers resolved to go and seek their fortune, and they begged a blessing of their parents. Their mother got ready their things for the journey, and gave them the best that she had in the house to eat on the way. Then the fool began to beg them to send him off too. His mother told him he should not go. Why shouldest thou go? said his mother. Dost thou think thou canst do what wiser men cannot? But the fool was always singing the same refrain. I think I can. I want to go. At length his mother saw she could do nothing with him. So she gave him a poor crust of black bread and sent him out. The fool went and went, and at last he met an old man. They greeted each other, and the old man asked, Where art thou going? Look now, said the fool, the Tsar has promised to give his daughter to him who shall make a flying ship. And canst thou make such a ship? No, I cannot, but I'll get it made for me somewhere. And where is that somewhere? God only knows. Well, in that case, sit down here, rest, and eat a bit. Share with me what thou hast in thy knapsack. Nay, it is such stuff that I am ashamed to share it with thee. Nonsense. Take it out. What God has given is quite good enough to be eaten. The fool undid his knapsack, and could hardly believe his eyes. There, instead of the dry crust of brown bread, lay white rolls and diverse savoury meats and he gave them to the old man. So they ate together, and the old man said to the fool, Go into the wood, straight up to the first tree, strike the trunk with thine axe, then fall with thy face to the ground, and wait till thou art aroused. Thou wilt see before thee a ship quite ready. Sit in it, and fly. And whomever thou dost meet on thy road, gather him up, and give him a lift on his journey. So our fool blessed the old man, took leave of him, and went into the wood. He went up to the first tree and did exactly as he had been commanded. He struck the trunk with his axe and fell with his face to the ground and went to sleep. In a little while, something or other awoke him. The fool rose up and saw a ship quite ready beside him. Without loss of time, he got into it, and the ship flew up into the air. It flew and flew, and look! There on the road below him was a man lying with his ear to the earth. "'Good day, uncle!' cried the fool. "'Good day!' What art thou doing? I am listening to what is going on in the world. Art thou travelling? Yea. Then take a seat in the ship beside me, and I'll give thee a lift on thy journey. So the man got into the ship, and flew on further. They flew, and flew, and look! A man was coming along, hopping on one leg, with the other leg tied tightly to his ear. Good day, uncle. Why art thou hopping on one leg? Why, if I were to untie the other, I should stride around half the world in a single stride. So long are my steps. Then take a seat in the ship beside me. So the man got into the ship, and they flew on further. They flew and flew, and look. A man was standing with a gun, taking aim. But at what, they could not see. Good day, uncle. At what art thou aiming? Oh, I am aiming at a mark the size of a pea, at the distance of one hundred leagues. That's what I call shooting. Art thou travelling? Yea. Then take a seat in the ship beside me. I'll give thee a lift on thy journey. So the man sat down, and they flew on. They flew and flew, and look, a man was walking in the forest, and on his shoulders was a bundle of wood. Good day, uncle. Why art thou dragging wood about? Oh, but this is not common wood. Of what sort is it, then? It is of such sort that if it be scattered, a whole army will spring up. 
Take a seat with us, then. I'll give thee a lift on thy journey. So he also sat down with them, and they flew on further. They flew, and flew, and look. A man was carrying a stack of straw. Good day, uncle. Whither art thou carrying that straw? To the village. Is there little straw in the village, then? Nay, but this straw is of such a kind, if it be scattered on the hottest summer day, cold will once set in with snow and frost. Take a seat with us, then. I'll give thee a lift on thy journey. So they flew and flew, and soon they flew into the Tsar's courtyard. The Tsar was sitting at a table, and he saw the flying ship drop down from the sky outside his window. In great surprise, he sent his servant to ask who it was that had accomplished the task. The servant went to the ship, and looked, and brought back word to the Tsar that it was but a miserable little peasant who was flying the ship. The Tsar felt a thinking. He did not wish to give his daughter to a simple peasant, so he began to consider how he could rid himself of such a son-in-law. I will set him a task he can never perform, thought he. Immediately he called his servant, and bade him to say to the fool, Thou shalt give thy master, the Tsar, some of the living and singing water from the other end of the world and mind that thou bringst it here before the end of the meal which he is now even eating. Shouldst thou fail this, thou shalt pay for it with thy life. Now at the very time the Tsar was giving the command to his servant, the first comrade whom the four had taken into the ship, that is to say, Sharpia, heard what the Tsar had said, and told it to the fool. What shall I do now? the fool said. If I travel for my whole life, I shall never get to the other end of the world, let alone bringing the water here before the imperial meal is over. Never fear, said Swift of foot. I'll manage it for thee. The servant came and made the known Tsar's commandments. Say I fetch it, replied the fool. And Swift foot untied his leg from his ear, ran off, and in a twinkling was at the other end of the earth. There he got the living and singing water. I must make haste and return presently, said he. But I've plenty of time for a nap first. And he sat down under a water mill and went to sleep. The Tsar's dinner was drawing to a close. He was eating dessert, and was just putting the last sweetmeat to his lips. Still Swiftfoot did not turn up, so it appeared that all hope was lost for the fool. But Sharpia bent down to the earth, and listened. Oh no, he cried, Swift of foot has fallen asleep beneath the mill. I can hear him snoring. Then hit the mark, seized the, his gun, and fired a shot into the mill, just above the sleeper's head. The noise awoke swift of foot, who took one great stride, and there he was back at the ship with the water. The Tsar was ready to rise from the table, when the fool laid the water at his feet. At this the Tsar was astounded. He saw he must think of some other way of getting rid of the fool, so he sent his servant to him, and bade him prepare for his wedding. First, go to the bathroom assigned thee, and have a good wash. Now this bathroom was made of cast iron and the Tsar commanded that it should be heated hotter than hot. So they heated the bath red hot. The fool went to wash himself. But when he drew near and felt the waves of heat that came forth from the door, he summoned the comrade with the straw. I must strew the floor, said the comrade. So both were locked in the bathroom. The comrade scattered the straw. The room at once became icy cold, and the water in the bath froze. So the fool scarcely washed himself properly. He crept up onto the stove, and there he passed the whole night. In the morning, servants opened the door of the bath. They found the fool alive and well, lying on the stove, and singing songs. They brought word thereof to the Tsar. The Tsar was now sore troubled. He did not know how to get rid of the fool. He thought and thought, and at length he commanded the fool to produce a whole army of his own. How will a simple peasant be able to gather an army, he thought. He will surely fail this time. The servant came to the fool, and said, If thou wilt have the Tsarevna, thou must, before morning, put a whole army on foot. As soon as the fool heard this, he said, You have delivered me from my straits more than once, my friends, but it is plain nothing that can be done now. Thou art a pretty fellow, said the man with the bundle of wood. Why, thou hast clean forgotten me. So the fool took courage again and sent this word to the Tsar. I agree. I shall raise up the army our master, the Tsar, demands of me. But tell him, that should he again refuse to keep his word with me, 
with the very army he bids with me, I shall conquer this whole kingdom. At night, the fool's companion went into the fields, took his bundle of wood, and began scattering the faggots in different directions. Immediately, a countless army sprang up, both horse and foot. In the morning, the Tsar saw it, a multitude in arms swarming over the whole countryside. And then, at last, he cried, I am forced to yield. Such an army would conquer my whole kingdom. So he sent in all haste to the fool with gifts of precious ornaments and raiment, and bade him come to be welcomed at court and married to the Tsarevna. The fool attired himself in these costly garments. Then he richly repaid his friends, who had proven such good comrades, and was off to the Tsar. The same day he wedded the Tsarevna and lived henceforth with her at court. It now appeared that he was no fool at all, as men had thought him, but in truth a wise and clever young man. So the Tsar and Tsarevna grew very fond of him, and it was soon his wisdom that was governing the kingdom. End of section 41